Welcome to the EW Podcast. I'm Eric White. In this episode, I speak with ABA Jeremy. EJ is a member of the U.S. men's national beach handball and touch rugby teams. In this episode, we chat about ambidexterity. Being ambidextrous has played a major role in EJ's success as an athlete, and here we get into how he became ambidextrous, um, what made him want to be ambidextrous, and the benefits of practicing. I was put into contact with EJ through a mutual connection, Coach Michael Lavery, who is the founder of Whole Brain Power. Whole Brain Power is the training program that EJ utilized to become ambidextrous, and it is featured in episode two of this podcast in my conversation with the master himself, Michael Lavery. If after listening to my conversation with EJ, you are a little curious yourself about Whole Brain Power, I would recommend checking out that episode or just checking out the book, which you can find at Amazon. So without further ado, here is my conversation with EJ about ambidexterity. I'm here with ABA Jeremy, EJ for short. How are you today, man? I'm doing well, Eric. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Um, so today we're going to talk a, at length about ambidexterity. Um, but before we get into that, let's uh, just give some background about who you are and what you do currently. Well, I guess the most prominent thing about me is I'm an athlete. Uh, I play for the U.S. national team in two different sports, uh, beach handball, patch rugby. And I'm actually five weeks away for competing with Team USA at the inaugural World Beach Games in Doha, Qatar. So that's the most immediate thing that I'm gearing up for. Uh, but as far as like why I'm on this call, is uh, because I'm an athlete that also plays amb- ambidextrously, and we'll go more in detail about that. But as far as just general, uh, who am I? I'm, I'm an athlete. I'm <laughs> guys who <laughs> put the ball into a net or tries to get it across the line. Um, and one of the things that separates you from most of the other athletes in your sport is that you are ambidextrous, correct? That is correct. Um, well, the only one that I know of that's competing at an international level that routinely shoots with both his left and his right. I, I watched the uh, presentation you sent me, and one of the things I thought was really interesting was how you discovered... Uh, ambidexterity and athletics. Can you want to just go into that and the, talk a little bit about the video that you saw and uh, what that meant to you at the time? Yeah, uh, I mean, for the most part, I was right-handed, quote-unquote, uh, until right before I turned 15. I was actually having a discussion with a couple baseball buddies of mine. You know, I grew up playing baseball, and it was actually in my, it was my sophomore year history class. And three of us were just talking baseball. And I grew up in Lake Oswego, Oregon, which is a suburb of Portland. And in the Pacific Northwest, the baseball team to follow is the Seattle Mariners because Portland didn't have a major league affiliate team. And at the time, uh, one of the best players in the league, arguably the best hitter in, in the majors when we were growing up, was a guy by the name of Ichiro Suzuki, who he could hit for power, but he's more of like a slap contact hitter, and he's extraordinarily fast. And for me, being a similar type of finesse player, but I was right-handed, I always thought of how many infield singles I would have had where I was out if I was left-handed versus where I was right-handed. And that led to a bit of a discussion as far as you know, switch hitting, uh, ambidexterity. Because as a batter, in baseball, with how the rules are defined, it's just advantageous to be a little bit closer to first base. Uh, so I always thought, you know, how, like, what would it take for me to learn to hit with my left? And then another buddy of mine's like, nah, I've taken like hundreds of practice cuts left handed. You have to be born that way. And I was like, well, I had to learn how to hit right handed. So I figured if I had the time and the reps and the education, I should in theory be able to learn how to hit left handed. And it became a little bit of a discussion, but it ultimately uh, inspired me to explore. You know, why aren't there more ambidextrous athletes? Are there more ambidextrous athletes? And I just haven't met them, not just in baseball, but in basketball, which is my other main sport. You know, outside of layups and passes, you know, there wasn't anybody that I knew of who was shooting perimeter jumpers with both hands. Or, you know, quarterbacks in the NFL, I didn't know of any that were rolling out 
left and right uh, and throwing. And so I didn't know too many ambidextrous athletes, but I was very intrigued uh, just of the whole concept and uh, the idea of, you know, could I learn to be ambidextrous? Because I played with different applications. And I mentioned like rolling out as a quarterback and you can roll out and throw mm-hmm. and, and how advantageous that would be. Uh, but just my mind just started coming up with all these different ideas in a variety of sports. So I was like, this would be so advantageous if you were able to do it. It was just a matter of, you know, is it possible? And in doing you know, some due diligence and uh, research on the topic, I eventually stumbled across a YouTube video uh, that summer of 2008 of Pat Vendetti, who's a professional baseball pitcher, switch pitcher, he throws with his left and his right. And it was a video of him uh, pitching against a switch hitter. And the entire debacle was really comical because each one is switching to the other <laughs> side to try to gain the advantage. So Pat would step up as if he's going to throw left-handed. And so the batter would move from the left-handed batter's box to the right-handed batter's box because you want to be swinging on the opposite side of the pitcher's throwing arm because you see a little bit more of the pitch. So it's a little bit more advantageous. So generally, batters will bat right-handed against left-handed pitchers and left-handed against right-handed pitchers. So the batter's switching every time Pat switched for the same advantage. And this went on for maybe a dozen minutes of them just switching back and forth and nothing was getting done. And the umpires ultimately made uh, the batter re- re- uh, respond to what Pat had to do. And then he, he struck out in three or four pitches and like he slammed his bat. But it was a really comical <laughs> four center top ten kind of moment. And when I saw that, that led to me exploring – Pat and his background and you know how did he become this ambidextrous pitcher because uh, I knew of switch hitters like that baseball but I didn't know of any switch pitchers and in doing due diligence on Pat I eventually stumbled across uh, the guy that put us together Michael Lavery and his program whole brain power and I started doing that uh, that summer and, you know I picked it up and I saw the athletes that Michael was working with he had you know his sons who were ambidextrous tennis players and uh, he had some videos of ambidextrous golfers, and he was working with a guy by the name of Chuck Mellick, who was another switch pitcher. And just seeing that he was working with ambidextrous athletes, uh, I kind of saw him as this like ambidexterity sports guru that I didn't that there were many of in the world. And started consulting with him that summer and tried to apply ambidexterity initially to basketball and baseball because those are my main two sports, and basketball probably being my number one love had the idea of being able to hit pull-up shots or step back to either side. You know, the ideas for the applications uh, for ambidexterity, once cultivated, those ideas ran through my mind, and that was enough of a motivator to initiate the process and stick through it through rough patches. You know, ultimately, I got involved in the handball, and that's where I've been able to apply a decade's worth of ambidexterity training. Uh, but I hope that that story answers your question. <laughs> uh, what got me into the dexterity and how I got involved with Michael. Yes, it absolutely does. That video is so comical, man, that I, I, I had never seen that before. And I was just blown away that I had missed that somehow that I could see how that would get you going down a, a rabbit hole for sure of how, how did he get, you know, how does this happen? Um, but did Michael have you uh, begin training with the writing and the hammer drills, I'm assuming? Or did he, because I noticed in the video you had a lot of kind of custom looking drills that you were doing. Um, was it a mixture of the custom with what's in the book or was, you know, how did you get started? Uh, so I saw a tip for writing ambidextrously before I got involved with Michael. So I was trying to write with my left hand and just do general basic things like brush my teeth, you know, eat food, just that kind of learn how to do basic things to develop, you know, fine gross motor control before I I even uh, started consulting with Michael. And then when I discovered whole brain power, he had me start with the hammer drills. I got two mallets, a couple golf balls. And I just start with bouncing a golf ball off the hammer. Pretty sure the first day I could do runs of maybe eight or 10 uh, on each hand. Uh, I've, of note, I had a natural affinity for it with my left. I 
don't know why, but just starting off, it was easier to do hammer drills with my left hand versus my right hand. Mm. Uh, but as I was doing the writing, and then when I started working with Michael, I started doing mirror writing with both my left and my right. That was one of the things from the book, from the program that I started integrating. Because I was just writing uh, left or right, just normal block letters with my left. And then when I started consulting with Michael, I started adding the mirror writing. And that progressed to doing upside down writing. And what you saw, I believe, in my presentation, what I've built up to is the simultaneous dual-handed writing, mm-hmm. which is all progression. Uh, as far as the more custom drills that you see, like me bouncing two golf balls on two mallets or bouncing golf ball from mallet while you know, juggling two tennis balls, you know, that was all a whole brain power progression that I wanted to start integrating different multitasking drills and kind of tailor full brain power to the sports I played because Michael worked a lot with golfers, tennis, baseball. He worked a lot with uh, stick to ball athletes and, you know, someone who played a sport like basketball. uh, I felt as if the applications of whole brain power and how ambidexterity would be applied in my particular athletic case was a little bit different than uh, what Michael was doing with the majority of the clients that he saw. And that's why I started creating different drills it's just applying Mm. what he did to what i was trying to do i see so you were using whole brain power as a launching point for the to ultimately create drills that uh use those tenants but ultimately suited your goals you you hit the nail on the head uh metaphorically speaking is you know taking the tenants of whole brain power and then integrating that into uh, the vision I had for myself as an ambidextrous athlete. And I'd been doing some juggling before and, uh, you know, my approach to ball sports training, I'd say is a little bit unique and that's a whole discussion in and of itself. But I took the tenets of whole brain power because what initially led me to Michael and the whole brain power was the desire to be this ambidextrous athlete. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I did other tenets of the program, like the memory drills and, uh, you had me memorize a deck of cards and you know there are other tenets of whole brain power that i've worked on but the primary one uh, was kind of ambidextrous sports development and the hammer drills were a big part of that and i just started to explore you know once i mm-hmm. was doing the mallets and went to the s-wing hammer and tried to do the ball peen hammer and then i started playing around with you know multitasking with the hammer drills and something else with my other hand and start doing the hammer drills while dribbling a basketball uh, eventually built up towards the simultaneous two ball two mallet and then i developed proficiency there where i was able to bounce each ball independently so i'd be able to stop one while bouncing the other or hit them uh asynchronistically if that's not just a word i made up <laughs> <laughs> so you're you're mastering one thing and then basically just trying to figure out how you can make it a little harder <laughs> and adding to it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's always, it's fun to play with. Um, I, I still have you know, two miles to two golf balls, uh, like in my gym bag. Uh, I don't do the hammer drills as religiously as I did, uh, like when I was first starting out, but like once in a blue moon, uh, I find that it's really Zen for me. To hear the sound of two golf balls hitting two mallets at the same time. So if I'm in a bit of a funk, I'll pull out just you know two you know one pound mallets, two golf balls. Do a run for like a hundred. It kind of gets me into this bit of a zen zone uh, when I'm in a funk. Uh, but when I was doing whole brain power, I do the hammer drills and the writing and the memory drills. I do those every day, and just over time, uh, you know other things take precedence in life. Mm-hmm. And and uh, also had to spend more time doing drills that were a little bit more specific to my sport. But at the core of uh, my coordination development is whole brain power. And for that, I'm eternally grateful for Michael and the role that he's played in my life. I know I wouldn't be the caliber of athlete uh, I am today if it weren't uh, for Michael, whole brain power, uh, him consulting with me and uh, just his instruction and his inspiration. Yeah, he's certainly a helpful force whenever you are willing to receive his message, for sure. Um, I want to go back to something you said about, you know, 
using the hammer drills to find your Zen. Cause that's something I've noticed too, is it becomes almost meditative. Um, do you meditate or do anything like that? Uh, I got into meditation like the latter half of high school. And I found that you know, doing the hammer drills helps me get into a similar calm minded state. Uh, and one of the things I like about just the general concept of the hammer drill is that you can make it easier or harder. Uh, you can make the surface that you're hitting off of a lot smaller. So with the ball beat hammer, that's more of like a challenging, uh, like focus uh, type of mind state. But you can also do the easier hammers if you just want something that's a little bit more like walking in the park is very zen. And for me, there's just something about the sound of the golf ball uh, in rhythm just going off of the mouth. It's very, very meditative. Mm-hmm. So, uh, w- like I said, once in a blue moon when I'm in a funk, it's one of those things that I turn to. Additionally, uh, I, can shoot, I can shoot two basketballs at once. And I don't play basketball nearly as much as I did growing up just because handball has taken its place in my life more or less. Uh, but every once in a while I'll find a gym, just bring two basketballs, just shoot you know, a couple free throws you know, just, uh, simultaneously. And uh, I find that doing dual handed simultaneous ambidexterity drills that uh, aren't too difficult where I don't necessarily have to think. I find that to be very meditative. Uh, it kind of gets me in a state of Zen that is difficult to explain, but helps me relax when uh, I'm in a bit of a funk or not feeling 100%. Mm-hmm. Just to backtrack a little bit, because um, I do want to cover, talk a little bit about how um, you used ambidexterity to your advantage to secure your spot on you know certain handball teams. Um, so by the time that you were trying out for handball teams or participating in handball, you were, how far along into your ambidexterity practice were you? Uh, so I initially started playing handball about six months into my ambidexterity journey. I was still 15. And then I had tried out for team USA the weekend before I turned 19. That is correct. Uh, and actually, no, scratch that. The weekend before I turned 20, I was 19 years old, about to become 20. Uh, so about five years into my ambidexterity journey when I tried out for Team USA. And I was 20 years old when I made uh, my Team USA debut in the left-handed position of the right wing. So about five years. And granted, I'd been an athlete up until then. It wasn't as if like I started playing sports mm-hmm. uh, when I started my ambidexterity journey. I was a relatively proficient athlete, pretty coordinated, pretty intelligent, pretty quick. Uh, so when I made Team USA, it was about five years into my ambidexterity journey. And uh, if I wasn't ambidextrous, I wouldn't have made the team at that time, at that age, because at the right-handed position that I would have played on, there was too much depth in our talent pool for me to get playing time. (sighs) And so the fact that I was able to play the left-handed position and what ended up happening around the time I made the team, we had a friendly where the guy who played the left-handed position who had started, he got injured. And so coach was, was like, hey, yeah, here's your call-up, here's your opportunity, and I played really well. And then a couple months later, I went to the Pan-American Championships. I was the starting right wing, you know, the left-handed position. Yeah. And so ambidexterity was what ultimately got me playing time when I otherwise wouldn't have had it. Granted, I was not nearly as far along as I was now. Uh, by no means would I have said I was a world-class player then, but I got playing time. I got the experience, and that boded well for me moving forward when otherwise if i was just trying to make it as a right-hander i think now i'd probably be first choice Mm. right-hander but back then uh i definitely would not have been and it was because i had playing time and playing experience in that left-handed position that i was able to continue to accelerate my development versus you know sitting behind 
two other guys and you know waiting for one guy to retire and try to compete with the other guy uh-huh. that did you find as you were developing your left hand um, that your right hand was actually getting better as well? Certainly. And uh, I think you mentioned this uh, in your podcast with Michael that I listened to. Uh, you know, one hand becomes a teacher, the other becomes a student. And you gain a greater perspective over your respective skills when you learn it from two different perspectives, as opposed to if you learn it from one. Uh there are things that my left arm could do because it wasn't too conditioned. So my sidearm shot, for example, was very fluid with my left. And I didn't notice respectively how tight it was on my right until I learned it on my left. It's like, oh, I can't do this on my right, even though I can do it on my left. And you know, each side learns from one another. And I think being ambidextrous just gives you a more holistic understanding of movements. And I mentioned this in uh, my ambidexterity and handball presentation that you watched is, you know, each side learned from the other, but ultimately it's the same human being. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people have this misconception that I have to do a hundred shots on my right. And then I'm starting at ground zero doing a hundred shots on my left. Like it's the same body. I can somewhat infer what a given motion is going to be when I mirror it to the other side. It's not mm-hmm. as if, like they're two completely different people and you have to address them individually, you know, just through my corpus callosum, you know, this, you know, from the book, you know, there's that information highway in our brain that connects the left and the right. And so if I'm learning something on my right, I have an idea of what it's like on my left and vice versa. And just naturally, uh, there are going to be certain asymmetries in your body. And there'll be things that you're smoother with on one side and things that you pick up smoother on the other side and whatever you pick up a little bit better on one side versus the other, you um, you teach the other side and you become a better overall player than if you just try to learn everything from one side. I have no idea really anything about handball. <clears throat> Is it pretty like competitive in the United States? How do we rank up versus the rest of the world? Like, how- Good question. Uh, you know, handball is one of the most popular sports across the globe. You know, the last real Olympics, it was the second highest rated team sport after soccer. Uh, but the weird dynamic with handball is that it's a sport that's globally popular and not popular in North America. Uh, so as far as the United States goes, um, we're notoriously known for underperforming in the sport <laughs> because it's not a popular sport here. We just lack uh, the number of guys who would otherwise have a lot of potential. It's just difficult recruiting world-class athletes uh, in an unknown sport. Mm. Um, but our beach handball team for our men, we won our North American championship for the first time ever. And as I mentioned earlier, we're five weeks away from competing in the first World Beach Games in Doha, Qatar. So we're on the way up in, in some regard. Uh, but by and large, you know, we take a backseat to basketball, baseball, football, water polo, lacrosse, volleyball, uh, other sports in the States. Uh, but it's been kind of a cool dynamic for me because I'll go and play in front of a packed out arena and take selfies with fans and sign autographs. And then I come back home and nobody knows my name just because our sport isn't popular here. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, up until now, I'm not complaining about. I've, I've been able to just go about my life relatively normally and not to deal with some of the perils of being a celebrity at home but then i get to go and compete and experience a little bit of that celebrity so it's been it's been cool it's been fun it's been a fun dynamic to experience i think it's a relatively rare dynamic to be a part of something that is very popular but just isn't popular where you're from Mm -hmm. and then have you know the experience of you know playing across the globe i think i've played in 15 countries the past five years and five continents uh but it's been nice to be able to you know, travel and be able to play this game that uh has a pretty large fan base interesting in, but just doesn't have a fan base in my home country <laughs> so when i'm home i'm just another guy and then don't <laughs> eat and you know I'm, I'm the handball ninja that's interesting that it's so popular worldwide, but that um, something seemingly as advantageous for the sport as being ambidextrous isn't very po- popular. Why is that? Well, 
you could say that being ambidextrous would be advantageous in a sport like basketball, in a sport like baseball, in a sport like American football, uh, in a sport like water polo. Uh, there's no shortage of applications that a proficient ambidextrous player in a variety of team sports would have. So I don't think it's why isn't handball where it's seemingly advantageous to be ambidextrous. There's such a few number. I think generally speaking, there's a relatively small number of ambidextrous athletes mm-hmm. in sports across the board. And there is a learning curve to it. Yeah, I say that you take a step back to ultimately take three steps forward. And wherever you have a learning curve in a competitive environment, you have people who want to take shortcuts and stick to what's expedient and what works now. Uh, because developing ambidextrous proficiency, if you know, let's say you're trying to get a scholarship. So when you're you know, in middle school, you're in high school, you're trying to compete and you're trying to win at that age. If let's say your right arm is better than your left and it's a close game and you shoot a jumper with your left and you miss your team, and your coach, they're, they're going to scold you. It's like, oh, you're not taking this seriously. We're trying to win, and you're trying to, you know, be ambidextrous. So, uh, I don't. I just. I think generally speaking, sports are so competitive, and people don't have the patience. Mm. Like it, it really takes time. It's not something that, at least in my experience, it's not something that uh, you know many people are born with. You know, someone like Pat, you know, his dad had been working on it with him since he was, you know, three, four, five. Mm-hmm. But for a given athlete in a sport like handball, water polo, basketball, who wants to be ambidextrous, it's certainly possible. And you know, once you have that breakthrough in your development where you have proficiency with your right or your left hand, and then you start working on those advantageous aspects that an ambidextrous athlete can bring to a sport that a non-ambidextrous athlete can't, it's worth it. But up until then, uh, it's very difficult, and you have to be willing to make a lot of mistakes. You have to be willing to put your ego aside. You know, I had games as a handball player growing up where I missed every shot with my left hand, like shots that were wide open that I should have made just because the feeling wasn't quite there. And it takes a rare athlete to be willing to mess up and mess up and mess up, knowing that on the other side, you'll ultimately have a skill set that the rest of the world doesn't have. Mm -hmm. But you have to be willing to look bad in front of your friends. You have to be willing to make mistakes in front of your coaches. And as hyper-competitive sports are, particularly in the United States, that's just not a mindset that very many athletes have. You Mm -hmm. have to be willing to be the big picture. You have to be willing to be a late bloomer. Uh, with, With ambidextrous athletes that I've interacted with, very few were high school phenoms. Right? They're guys that you hear about maybe in college, a little bit later down the road, but very few are you know, 10-year-old kids who are just killing their competition with both their left and their right. You know, the guys that you hear about a little bit later down the road, because there is a learning curve. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's worth it, but you have to be patient. And in our immediate gratification society, that sort of patience is very rare. Mm-hmm. Is that something in your interactions, uh, across the world when you're competing do you see people opening up to the idea other athletes perhaps showing curiosity and interest in pursuing uh ambidexterity or is that something that isn't really permeating the culture yet uh the curiosity is there but i say people more see me as an anomaly Mm. uh oh i can also be ambidextrous right was one of the things that I've tried to demonstrate through my journey is you know I wasn't I wasn't born this way and it was a process. Uh, and 15 years old, I'd say, is relatively late to like start something as far as if you want to be a professional athlete. Uh, but I just want to show people that it's possible, uh, but it takes time. And you know, for my competitors in the world. It's like, oh, you know, maybe if I was like 10 years old, I could do it over again. I'd try to be ambidextrous, but it's too late for me now. Mm -hmm. It's It's not been the kind of thing where at least my contemporaries look at me and like, oh, I can do that too. Uh, There have been a lot of instructors who uh, 
with their youth are more open to the idea of training ambidextrous players. Uh, so there's been a small effect. Mm-hmm. Uh, I won't think I'll see another ambidextrous player uh, while I'm competing, but I can definitely see the following generation. Uh, there may be, you know, three, four, five guys who are kids now who are growing up watching me play. They're like, oh, it's possible, and they're putting them to work. Uh, so that by the time they get to a professional level and international level, it's a skill set that they have as well. Uh, but I don't think it's this rapid. Now there's a hundred plus handball players competing at the highest level who are throwing with both hands. Uh, I don't think uh, the movement in that sense is going to be that quick because it right. does take time. Uh, it's difficult enough to be a pro athlete just on one side. Uh, even more so on the other side. And just because somebody starts a journey of ambidexterity, there's no guarantee they're going to be a pro. So as far as, you know, what I think about, you know, ambidexterity and handball, and if they're going to be other players like myself, uh, I do, but I don't think it will necessarily be in my generation. It'll, it'll take time. Uh, you know, it's just now that, People are open and accepting the idea that it's possible. I'm still not sure people are open to the idea that it's possible for themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, though that they, even though they see that it's possible. Uh, so I think it'll take time. I think it'll be at least another generation. But I can see you know, a kid or two in the next generation who maybe you know, a 10-year-old kid who's following me on Instagram now. You know, by the time that you know, he's in his early 20s, you know, maybe not at a professional level, but maybe a semi-professional level. He's competing with both hands and like, oh, there's another athlete. And then another athlete in a different part of the globe pops up. And slowly but surely, uh, different athletes pop up, different coaches uh, start looking at how do we develop ambidextrous players? How do we game plan with the ambidextrous, ambidextrous player in mind? And then it permeates from there. Uh, I'm not going to say I'm the very first ambidextrous player in handball. I will say I'm currently the only one uh, at the level I'm playing at that routinely shifts from both with the proficiency that I have. There's one guy from the Faroe Islands, uh, which is a much smaller handball country uh, that competes in Europe that I've seen him shoot with both hands and then there's one junior player in latin america that i heard of i haven't been able to see him play but somebody made reference of him to myself uh, so maybe it's three if you count uh kind of a smaller handball country and uh you know a junior player uh, but as far as you know competing at a world championship level i'm the only one that i know of that's routinely shooting left and right do they keep track of all your stats for mixed like uh, attempts and you know your per- your make percentage? Yeah, um, but they don't split it by hand. Oh, uh, okay. It's, it's just like, for one. It's, it's yeah. just me as a shooter. Like, <laughs> yeah, that'd be an interesting stat. For myself to see. personally, uh, I try not to be super analytical about it, but definitely in the back of my mind, I know. Like, if I know if I scored, you know, eight goals in a game. Like I'll have an idea that I scored, you know, five of them with my left and three of them with my right. Uh, and that's just is that is that a result of just the side you're playing on? Are you still playing on the left-handed side, the right side? Um, you know, now I've this past year in particular, I transitioned into a center role, so I'm more of a team's primary playmaker, and it also gives me the opportunity to utilize both. Uh, <laughs> but I play a little bit of the center and a little bit on the right. For Team USA, and that's just uh, a personnel fit uh, for the group of guys that I play with. Uh, I'd say my shot split is probably 60-40 now, as far as how probably 60% of my shots are with my right and 40% are with my left. And that varies from game to game. and also varies um, on which position I'm playing against, I guess, a given opponent. Uh I, I'm not going to say it's exactly 50-50. That'd be a, a bit idealistic, a bit unrealistic. The reality is I just try to use whatever hand I feel as if it's going to beat the defense in a given situation. 
and for the role I have now, the position I'm in now, that's maybe shooting with my right a little bit more than I shoot with my left. But it varies from game to game. I've had games where I've taken almost all, if not all, my shots with my left, uh, even at international level. But I'd say percentage wise, I'd probably shoot 60% of my shots internationally with my right and 40% with my left. And when you're, when you're training, <clears throat> is this split 50 50? everything you do no um i'd say it's close it's not like number for number if i've done 100 reps on my right it's like i've got to do 100 reps on my left uh type of a deal uh let's say in training i try to be a little bit more cognizant of doing more with my left Uh, but uh, there, there are a number of factors in play also the kind of how I'm feeling, you know, if one arm has a little bit of a niggle, I'll just take more reps on the other side. Uh, also, if I'm training personally versus if I'm training, you know, in accordance with the guys. But I will say I do try to be more cognizant in training to use my left for more reps. Um, or just use whatever hand I feel as if I'm shooting less with in general. Um, there are things that I do better with my left than my right. So when I go into training, those things I try to be cognizant of, like I try to use my right arm when working on this shot that I'm really good at with my left and not as good as with my right. Mm-hmm. And then the things that, that I'm better at with my right, I try to be more cognizant of in training to work on my left hand for those skills that I'm better on my right than my left. Um, but I don't keep track diligently as far as how many reps I'm taking on one side versus the other. I'd say the split's about 50-50. Okay. But it's but more like, an initiative, like, this is what I'm working on. I got to get more reps here. Or, any of the side of my body is feeling a little bit sore, I'll just get more reps over here. But I'm not uh, microanalyzing the amount of reps I'm doing for given exercise on both sides, if that answers your question. Yes, absolutely. And the, the day-to-day stuff you're doing, um, brushing your teeth, eating sandwiches, are you doing all of this stuff consciously – with your left hand to facilitate your goal of complete ambidexterity? Certainly. Uh, now it's not something I really have to think of. I just, I always try to learn new skills with whatever hand feels less intuitive. Uh, oh, really? Less intuitive. Yeah. So if, if I'm learning something that's completely brand new, I'll try one on one side, one on the other side, whichever one, I feel like I'm better at off the jump. I'll try to learn it on the other side (laughs) and then go back to the side where I had a little bit more proficiency. Uh, And this is kind of the the approach. What's the logic there? Is it just, Uh, I mean, it, it, you know, with learning new things, there's always the one side's a teacher, one side's a student process. And I found that uh, the carryover between the two is, you know, better when you're putting conscious effort towards what you aren't, you feel as if you're not as good at. I feel as if it's easier to transition from the side I'm not as good at to the side that I'm better at versus vice versa. Mm. Uh, and so for myself, it's generally learning things initially on my left. I feel as if just from a general MX standpoint, standpoint, uh, it's beneficial it's more beneficial to learn things on my left and then try to mirror it to my right where I grew up right-handed. And so I feel as if there's just more of an innate proficiency to pick up things versus me learning something on my right and then trying to learn it on my left. Yeah, that makes sense. I have not made the switch to, you know, doing all of my day-to-day things with my left, but I need to reevaluate how I'm approaching certain things like brushing my teeth because <laughs> that you're right. It is. It's if you just f- replace all of those little things throughout your day with it, um, ultimately that's, that's what's going to make the difference. Agreed. It, it accelerates your development, uh, significantly. Yeah. Because you don't want to be just ambidextrous for your sport. And I think that's a mistake that a lot of people will look at ambidexterity. It's like, Oh, I want to be like a switch pitcher. And, you know, they'll go out and they'll throw with both hands, but they don't 
apply that ambidexterity to every facet of their life. And I can only speak for myself, but I don't see myself making the same gains in finding gross motor control and coordination if I just train ambidextrously in the context of sport as opposed to learning how to do everything ambidextrously, like learning how to write and brush your teeth and just all the little things because those are all fine motor control reps uh, for you. And that's honestly the place to start. You know, that's where I started you know, before I started consulting with Michael and got an idea for like hammer drills and different uh, tenants to work on. It was just a matter of doing little things, mm-hmm. doing your day-to-day things, um, not necessarily with your left, but whatever size is the opposite of how you do it. Because I learned, because once I started my ambidexterity journey, I consciously learned that, oh, I just did certain things with my left. Like, you know, fork was just always in my left hand. Uh, so let me use a fork on my right and a knife on the left. And uh, just when you're making those conscious decisions to do things with one hand versus the other, uh, your understanding of handedness and your overall coordination takes a greater jump than if you're only thinking of ambidexterity within the context of, you know, doing my mirror drills or mm-hmm. just doing whole brain power. You know, you want it to be something that's a facet uh, of your life. Were there other benefits that you saw outside of um, competition to the training? Certainly. Uh, you know, one, I think the perspective I have, not just on sport, but uh, on movement, on life, I think there's something to be said for just an ambidextrous perspective uh, looking at the world. I feel as if I'm, I'm more open-minded. Uh, my ability to relate unrelated things, uh, I attribute in some part to my ambidext- ambidextrous development. And I mentioned this in my ambidexterity and beach handball presentation, uh, but one of the unsung benefits to ambidexterity is your health from a balance perspective. When you think of mm. kind of the, the asymmetries and uh, I, I don't necessarily want to say deformities, but just the imbalances that um, will naturally manifest in a body where you do things unilaterally, where you always jump off one foot, and always throw with one hand. Um, I just feel physically more balanced. And I've also been able to spare myself of overuse related injuries. I think that I think athletes naturally are pretty driven people. And once you get going to something, you just want to keep on going and keep on working towards figuring something out. And I've been able to spare my body of the fatigue of doing everything on one side. And the analogy I used in my presentation was, let's say you can throw a hundred times with an arm before it's too fatigued to continue. Mm-hmm. If someone is just right-handed, they'll throw 100 times to their right, and then the training session's done. Even if physically or neurologically they could continue, they want to continue, like their arm is just too fatigued, right? And so what other so what athletes will do is that they'll stop, which is the smart thing to do when you're fatigued, or they'll try to keep on pushing on that one side, and then you'll have an overuse-related injury. Whereas if you train ambidextrously, even if you don't play ambidextrously, yeah, I can do 75 reps with my right, 75 reps with my left. So I personally have done 150 reps on a given skill from two different perspectives, but each side has only taken 75 reps. So mm-hmm. I'm less fatigued versus if I were to do all my reps on one side, and I've gotten more reps in from a neurological perspective, and I've gotten it from two perspectives as opposed to one. So it feels as if my ability to learn that skill is greatly accelerated with my ambidextrous approach versus if I only train my reps on one side. Mm. Do you have any hobbies outside of handball, like uh, crafts or anything? Are you doing, you know, other stuff outside of sports and consciously using your left hand? Yeah. Um, I really enjoy social dancing. That's something I got into when I was in college. It's like my go-to hobby outside of sport. Uh, but when you like when you leave certain turns, uh, there's sort of a preset way to go about it, and having more of an ambidextrous approach has helped me with you know turning in different directions and creating different moves 
that are still on beat and on rhythm because I can you know, turn you know partner with either hand. Uh, there's certainly been an application for my ambidexterity uh, in facets outside of sport, and uh, it's something that I try to be cognizant of. Uh, actually, I don't even have to try to be at this point. It's just kind of who I am. Just my general approach to life is. Oh, that was left-handed. Uh, you you just notice the handedness of certain things when you become ambidextrous. It's like, oh, that went clockwise. That went counterclockwise. And mm-hmm. in the training and development of anything, uh, as I mentioned, I always try to learn things from the perspective of the side I don't naturally uh, have it figured out on, or I, it doesn't feel as intuitive, because that is what I've found to accelerate my development and understanding of just about anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it's whether it's sport, whether it's dancing, uh, whether it's writing or drawing, um, you know, playing an instrument, you know, play the drums growing up. Uh, yeah, I feel as if there's an, a, a positive ambidextrous application, uh, even if you aren't performing everything ambidextrously. Just kind of having that ambidextrous understanding, just helping you to use spatial intelligence and uh, your understanding uh, of sides and. I feel as if it gives you a more global perspective. Mm -hmm. It sounded like it's uh, made you more mindful as well because it takes a certain level of mindfulness and awareness to, to be brushing your teeth and be, and to suddenly think, Oh, I'm, I, I'm going to do this with my other hand and, or to be eating, to be going through these tasks that are otherwise pretty, you know, thoughtless um, to, to to inject some thought into that and, get yourself to use your other hand. I think that's pretty impressive because I think that's one of the things that I have difficulty with is just remembering to do it. <laughs> yeah, as, as I mentioned, you know, that's the easiest place to start is just doing the basic things that you otherwise do in your life from the other side. At least for me, it's a lot easier than like, okay, I'm going to be ambidextrous now. You know, here's my you know four pages of left-handed writing and I'm done. You know, when you make it a part of your day-to-day life, one, that's going to help accelerate uh, just your overall coordination. And two, like you said, it's, it's just a mindfulness thing. You know, you make things that you otherwise are just kind of zoned out about. You put a little bit conscious thought into it. When you do it on your side, that's a little bit weaker. You know, granted, I wouldn't like recommend you doing something potentially dangerous um, on your other side if you don't feel comfortable with it. But little things, uh, just from like I said, brushing your teeth, or even just opening, you know, twisting a doorknob, like mm-hmm. things that you know are very rudimentary. That there's going to be relatively little drawback if you aren't a hundred percent on, or you aren't super smooth with. Uh, but that's what ultimately is going to lay your foundation before you start getting into different activities, different exercises, because you want to have an ambidextrous approach to life. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not just oh, I can use my left hand or my right hand, and I talk about this in my presentation, is you want to be right and left-handed, not right or left-handed. Mm-hmm. And, you, know, you want to be able to have an integrated approach to utilizing your dexterity in your life. Because that's ultimately what it's about. It's not just, oh, I've got this party trick where I can write with my left hand. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're otherwise still kind of segmented in you know, your thinking. You know, it's really... You know, Michael. You know, Michael calls it whole brain power. Uh, you you really want to be whole. It's not just a bunch of parts. You, know, you mm-hmm. really want to be whole. And uh, so, the easiest way to start is just those you know little things that you're otherwise you have enough proficiency with that you can just kind of zombie through. Just put a little bit of mindfulness into it. Just like, oh, I normally open this door with my right. Let me open it with my left. Or oh, I normally take my first step down a set of stairs with my right let me take my first set down the set of stairs with my left or maybe i should say up a set of stairs so i don't be live so i'm not liable if you fall down a set of stairs <laughs> <laughs> but like, like just just little things because it makes you more mindful um, mm. there's there are a lot of things that we just do on autopilot on one side and if you just make it you know a life exercise like if i'm opening this door like what hand do i naturally reach out for to open this door or if I'm walking up a set of stairs, do I naturally step with one foot over the other? And so is my other foot naturally a plant foot? And when you become mindful of those things, you become mindful of some of the imbalances or some of the inefficiencies that you have, not just on your weaker side, but on your dominant side as well. 
Mm. When you become mindful of those things, you can address them, and that accelerates your whole brain development. Mm. Because when you do a program, and I'm, I'm speaking for myself, um, when you do a program, you're making a conscious effort to do it every day. Uh, but your ability to do something when you have so many other things in your life that go on, uh, it, it can be easy for things to fall by the wayside. Uh, um, so if you can make it a part of the things you're already going to do in your day, yeah, you know, walking, running, uh, you're picking up bags, you know, the things that you're just going to do as a human being, try doing those things with your other side. And then if you have certain aspirations as far as where you want to take your ambidexterity, then some of those practices, those uh, prescribed practices like writing, the hammer drills, uh, things that aren't necessarily going to be a part of your average person's day to day, but things that you can make a conscious practice out of and delve into will accelerate your development even more. But I say just to start, just the basic things in your life, just be mindful of, you know, what am I doing on what side? And then try practice, you know, the really simple things that you've been doing forever on one side that you take for granted. Just be mindful and try doing those things with your other side. And once you develop a little bit of, of a ground uh, framework uh, with ambidexterity and kind of a dual-handed mindedness or dual-sided mindedness, then you know, try writing. Just maybe just try writing the alphabet with your left hand. Uh, I remember my first time, it took me half an hour. And granted, there's only 26 letters. It took me more than a minute per letter. I'd, I'd, and I'd start writing and I'd feel as if I'd get to rest because I had such little uh, fine motor control right at my left. And then by the time I wrote my third letter, I'd just be tired. Like my left hand would be sore. <laughs> and so I'd like shake it out. And like, mind you, like I said, an alphabet's 26 letters. It took me more than a minute per letter just to write A to Z my first time out. Uh, but you get better every time you do it. Yeah. Those neurons in your brain, uh, they fire and they make connections and they make things progressively easier for you. Uh, so Mike said, my general advice is just start with the basics and progressively uh, try to challenge yourself as far as you know, what you can do on both sides. Well, thanks for your time, EJ. I appreciate it, man. Man, uh, it's super fun for me to rap about and I appreciate you having me on the podcast, Eric. Uh, I'm at Handball Ninja on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. That's at Handball, H-A-N-D-B-A-L-L, Ninja, N-I-N-G-A. Uh, you can find me at Handball Ninja, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And you'll find all that I do as an athlete, and you'll see references to a lot of the things that we talked about on this podcast. Thank you for listening to the EW Podcast. I appreciate you sticking it the whole way through. If you found something useful from this podcast, please feel free to share with your friends or leave a review on iTunes or Spotify. You can also find the podcast on Instagram at The EW Podcast and Twitter. Thanks again and until next time.